Welcome, everybody, on this beautiful Thursday. And I want to uh, thank Marcel Sanchez Prieto very much um, for gracing us with his presence. And uh, um, I look forward to hearing what he has to say. Um, as a transnational architect, educated in Mexico and the United States, living in Mexico and teaching in San Diego, and demonstrating through his built work in Tijuana, the value of ethical practice that celebrates cross-cultural enrichment, Marcel Sanchez Prieto's perspective has taken on greater urgency in our current climate. Today, more than ever, Marcel's unique architectural voice warrants the widest possible audience, and I'm grateful to him for having agreed to lecture today. The quality of awards that their work has received reflect the growing reputation of Marcel and his partner, Adriana Cuellar in their collaborative office, CRO Studio. Their architectural vision, that good design grows out of a sense of curiosity and thoughtful inquiry, is gaining international notice. From inclusion in the Mexican pavilion of the Venice Architectural Biennale, induction into the Tijuana Walk of Fame for citizens who have significantly contributed to the growth of the city, to a progressive architecture design award, their accolades are many and diverse. Marcel is professor at Woodbury University's San Diego campus, located in an environment that is adjacent to a contested international border and within an ecology that amplifies the negative effects of climate change. San Diego's campus acts as an architectural laboratory for some of the most complex issues of our time. In this environment, the work of Marcel and his students exerts a rich influence with breathtaking results, not hampered by controversies, but enlightened by possibilities. As a practicing architect and inspiring educator, he exemplifies our institutional mission in helping to educate a new generation of designers ready to grapple, indeed, as well as intent, with architecture that makes a difference. In 2018, Marcel was named a Rome Prize Fellow in recognition of his willingness to tackle dense topics head on, sustainable revitalization of city neighborhoods, emergent growth on urban per peripheries, resurgence of civic space, migrant populations, and the impact of industry and new material technologies. His work is exceptional, rigorous, thoughtful, and as beautifully delineated as it is critically considered. Marcel's unique citizen architect voice is so necessary to the discipline of architecture. And we are fortunate to have him a member of our community. Please join me in welcoming Marcel to the virtual stage. Thanks. Thank you for those so kind words. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you for everybody for, for putting this together. You know, there's like a, a lot of coordination and, and, and now working, trying to kind of get out there is a, is, a, is a task. And I really appreciate everybody who came in and, and give us a little bit of your time and, give me the opportunity to share some of other projects. I, let me just start by, by sharing my, my presentation, my screen. Give me one second. Share. And I think you are now going to, going to see this. All right. I think we're there. Anyways. Um, so let me start by, by framing our practice by how some elements have influenced our approach to architecture. And um, evidently, the, the border has been a big influence in our work, and the physicality of this element has been a constant reminder of inequality. But at the same time, how uh, growing up so close to certain, a certain point as a backdrop to daily life has framed a sense of, uh, of to overcome obstacles, to see the region as an opportunistic landscape, a territory that could be characterized by the use of conflict to create advantage, but in a more positive way. So slums in rapid urbanization, in constant pressure of dynamics of, of the border, and in many ways has put us uh, in front of the necessities of dwelling in, at the outset of the speculation of land. So the, what you see here is, uh, on the top is three photographs that is the backyard of my house. This is how we, we bought, and that uh, wall or fence in the back is the international border. And literally, that's the, the division between Mexico and the United States. And here's how it was um, 
fix or kind of redesign when we had the kits. And in this uh, photograph here is uh, 2019 when they changed the wall and they did that in, in four hours. Well, let me, let me, I'm here, right? So let me have my can show you. So I'm gonna just poke in here, get out. And um, yeah, what you see in the back, that's the wall. It's a little bit messy growing, but just right there on the other side is the United States. So let me go back and hook up this. Um, so uh, that has been a big factor. And one of the reasons we bought the house is, is in reality that, that we are in constant um, reminding us and knowing what is this space, what is this, this uh, area and the border. And of course, other factors, the rapid urbanization, like we're saying, this kind of growth that happened uh, when the privatization of housing came along in order, of course, in contrast with um, the spontaneous, let's say, right, growth, the slums, the regular settlements, they are in conflict. They're in conflict always uh, about this image that even the developers create, right? This image of Urbi was a, a, a pamphlet they were using to sell the idea that your house is this kind of castle and you are in, in within this in enclave. So, of course, the idea of this image is, 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 is in constant pressure. So, in similar way, Tijuana has been a gateway of international trade, urban concentrations of large uh, developments and international companies that have uh, been approaching the city. But also a result in the erasure of its memory. The city always is in constant erasure, deleting uh, many of the buildings, like the bull, uh, bullfighting ring that in one night, no, nobody knew and they just demolished that. So these factors, right, uh, the rapid growth and the selling of illusions make the cities a structure or a region. How to work, where, and with whom has been a very important uh, aspect of how to, to think about projects. They're a very small practice uh, that believes in collaborative work, and honestly, this is one of the main foundations of our work. We look for the expertise and opportunity that these collaborations can bring. We'll still have, we'll still have the present what could architecture role be in the current challenge of the environment? So yes, sustainable revitalization of city neighborhoods, like the, the eagle I was saying, the emerging growth of urban peripheries, resurgence of civic space, migrant populations, right, and the industry in material technology. And I will have to, I would like to say that also the awards uh, that we have been getting uh, is not an award for our office, and I won't, don't think that we are looking for the idea that the awards are for us, but the awards are more for the type of projects that we look for these ways to kind of get recognition through the project, that these projects are important to be recognized to continue doing this type of elements in the city that they are important to reconsider and, and, and they are fundamental to think in the city. So the awards is not so much for the office, but the awards for the projects in the type of conditions they can create in the city. So uh, I will present 10 projects um, uh, quickly. Don't worry, they're, they're, they're gonna, hopefully they're not, uh, uh, they're gonna be fast and, you, and get the whole uh, spectrum of what we do. And so in a way, represent uh, two, different types of, of, uh, of people that we work in a way, kind of, if you have to put it in a, in a synthesized way, it's like the elements of a plaza. We work with the government, we work with the, with the church, with the our diocesis, and then the, also with the private developers. And of course, I'm, at the end, at the, at the end um, um, project that we're going, I'm going to present is the work uh, at the American Academy, which has been a very important uh, aspect for Adriana personally and for me personally and how those two experiences came together. So I will start with uh, the project of um, Florido. This is a project, uh, uh, interesting project because we don't look for it. We don't look, uh, we, we don't get the projects. We always look for projects, which is really strange. We usually are formulating projects, trying to see what are the key typologies or the emergent typologies that we consider are important to start um, working with. 
So, but this project, is, it was interesting. It came up when I, we were in Woodbury and the lady just comes in into, into the school and says, hey, uh, I need a project in Tijuana at the outskirts of, of Tijuana. And um, uh, it's a commercial, um, small commercial uh, corner lot. Anyways, uh, the project, uh, uh, one of the questions that we had for this project, how was how to approach and reconsider the corner strip? In a very simple way, right? usually the corner strip, the commercial goes in one corner and then the parking lot is in the front. So in, in this case, what we tried to do is to bring uh, fragmenting uh, the parking lot and bring in the commercial as much as we can to the periphery and then creating a more street presence. Anyway, in, in this case, the, the, the client requested commercial in a restaurant, but uh, as we soon were working in the project, she said, well, I want a strip club on the third floor. I want a, uh, yes, a pole dancing, billiards board. And suddenly this project became a little bit kind of strange, right, in, in the type of environment. And the other factor is that suddenly when we start uh, de uh, designing, uh, working with them and designing this building, uh, we, we, we understood that why she came and she, why by herself, her, her husband was in jail, trafficking, and of course she wanted to invest uh, in this project, and at that time we, we were a little bit scared and now work with it. But anyways, she was great, she was really nice, and she said, I just wanted to kind of uh, create a business for for to stay my family and because my, my husband is in jail and I, we almost lost everything. So anyways, this project very rapidly became, uh, a project became about security and she felt vulnerable and she wanted to have something that can uh, also protect what she was there. So the project uh, started to become more about how to kind of design the skin. But in, in that regard, the wall is used as a medium to undertake this, but also to, to think about how to the concentration of the building is in relationship of aging and maintenance. So we call this um, modules, these three modules that you can see on the bottom, uh, drift dust in designing geometry to absorb the aging, to absorb how dust and time is being registered. So it's a rain screen facade controlling climate while taking advantage of time, using dust as an accumulation of its design opportunity, and the movement of the sun as a good way to play with the effect of death, both in a way celebrating and the registration of time. So now I'll show you um, the experimentations that we were doing is uh, aluminum, wood, and in the end we decided with concrete. Uh, obviously for the accessibility of the, of the know-how of the construction workers, and the affordability to develop it, but also by the subtlety in the material can give. The materiality going to the background while well, its geometrical qualities and strengths coming to the foreground, giving away the, uh, the, the dust as a, an element that comes into time and creates another perception of the pieces. So here you will see the effect and hopefully by well, you see here how dust starts to become in and also the connection of it. I think it was a lag in, in, in what you were hearing there, uh, but I hopefully you can still hear me well. Uh, now I'm going to jump into uh, a project that we did for the government. And this project is a project that we did with Cedesol. And uh, Cedesol is the government agency that sponsors projects for the progress of social development in communities with the greatest needs. Uh, the, due to the economic challenges and change in government that, that was going to happen in that period, we needed to work very fast. And this project was designed and all of it, construction documents and everything was done in one month. It's a 200 uh, square meter project, very fast. And we got, went to the site uh, in trying to work with them very in, in two days and seeing where we're going to position the building. And, and usually what happens in Mexico when you have these irregular settlements, and this is uh, what's called uh, Grupo Mexico and then changed to Camino Verde. And this area is, is, it was categorized one of the areas with the highest crime rate in Tijuana. And the, where the most uh, people, they didn't have any education. So what happens usually is that 
they channelize the garden. What does is channelize with concrete the river, right? The, 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 this portion of the bottom of the valley. And then they become these spaces, they become uh, collectors of trash, become collectors of, uh, of all the, the, the tires and trash that, that the neighborhood generates. And it becomes an infection point. So in that case, well, we need to kind of uh, also use the project on a way to, to alleviate this space, to create a better kind of uh, approach to it. And uh, we, we decided to put it on top in, in many projects, a part of this uh, collection of projects, we decided to put it on top on this area and become a bridge also, become a way to connecting the two sides of the neighborhood in, in creating a, a, a way that when disaster comes, when flooding comes, and all these things, that also have the opportunity to go from one side to the other side. And then, I'm going to go to the next one. So uh, our project rethinks the purpose of a library. At the beginning uh, of the project was to create um, a center, but own, more a center for, for, for people to kind of get uh, access to, to to teaching, to 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 so people can come and learn things. But we say, well, maybe we should focus this in more as a digital library, uh, a learning for the kids for the future. A more yes, it is kind of a uh, community center, a cultural center, but they have access to information. So in this case, uh, the collective space is also the living room of the of the whole neighborhood. What we did here is that uh, try to work on the sense of creating the bridge just bringing the building uh, to the center. But uh, the plan was that we were going to have an amphitheater and the amphitheater was going to be like uh, almost like 50 or 100 meters uh, a little bit further up. And we convinced them to kind of tuck it away and become part of it. And the whole, that whole move created the whole sense of creating uh, the, the small library, like I said, uh, into a tier kind of series of uh, tiers for classroom, the main center, and small moves just bringing out the bathrooms that uh, still when the, the, the building is not in operation, that people can come in and use the bathroom. And uh, of course, what we need to do is also protect the, the computers in the element. And um, so we created uh, one move of lifting up this one to create the, the stage two entrances and then bringing that out. Simple, it costs $110,000. If you think about it, $100,000, $110,000 is like investing $10,000, uh, right? For every person, for a person. And so if you think that you change already 10 persons at $10,000 and that you can change them, that they don't go and become uh, criminals, that's already a great investment. For sure, this has a, a, a bigger impact from that. So uh, here you see the, the whole point. So what these entrances became uh, also stages uh, uh, in, a, in a way that they become a platform for uh, the community leader can talk to, to the people. Also becomes a way that it becomes the, the goalie so they can kind of play in soccer and becomes the, 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 the part of the, of, the, of the net, right? Or also here where we were thinking that the back part becomes a stage, an open stage, and people can kind of do that. Sorry? Oh, no. Any, anyways, uh, so it becomes this series of, of, of tiers that people can hang out. So it became multifunctional in many ways. Uh, what, this is now the, the project that you see in the site. So the building seems uh, paradoxical in, in, in its context, where it's sharp edges concert the fragmentation of the informality, but also how it becomes a point of reference, a piece of infrastructure the community identifies. And uh, at the beginning, we, 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 we designed this building wide, not in the sense of purity, but more like we couldn't be enamored with materiality if it was going to be wood, concrete, or trying to think out that the materiality was uh, the, the representation or the effect or, or the element that's important. We, we decided it's going to be graffiti, it's going to be painted, it's going to be stuff is going to be happening to it. In, order, in, in that sense, even not having a perimeter fence, it was important that people can touch it and can do whatever they want. And um, interestingly enough, um, the building, uh, is still white. Uh, after five, six years, people have, have, uh, have still maintained the building. We were wrong. So now it has become a perfect extension. And even we're trying to uh, 
to say and paint it, do something to it. But now it becomes a symbol and say, no, we, we, we respect this building. So here you see uh, how a small moves of how the stairs become because kids come all the way from the bottom of the, of the channel, walking all the way to the top. So this becomes a resting space. We just wanted to create a way to kind of, kind of create shade and, and this tree's already grown. So keep people and kids come around and hang around and sit around here while they're kind of resting and going up to their houses. So here you see another, the, now the uh, facade in the front that we're talking about the entrance, right? And how this uh, space is, 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 is more like a framework, a, a staging of, of things to happen. And, and then suddenly what happens is that uh, there was a change of government. Immediately at that moment when the change of government comes, they, they put a fence, they put a chain link fence, they, 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 they say, this is not anymore a, a library. Uh, this is going to be the headquarters of the, of the community political party. And anyways, when I came there, uh, they said, the architect, don't worry, uh, we'll get this building back. We, it's going to be a library. Uh, and it's not from, it's not, I'm worried, it's, it's you, this, this is a building for you. And, and I will show now a video. <laughs> The people protested for three days. And this is what I'm saying. We have been working on this project. And this is not fair because they just come and take it up. What they want is for the youth, they want for the kids. It's the only thing they can leave us to have access to information to know. So this is uh, interesting because suddenly the work, of course, it did. We designed this in one month, but it took uh, from the process to getting into the community. The the other people that we were not part of the beginning of how to kind of get into the community, and it was a lot of work. And of course, architecture becomes a representation of that all that work. So here you see now how. Uh, after the three days of protesting, people take over, the community is in charge, not anymore the government, and the community organizes themselves and they are maintaining the building. Of course, with that profit organizations, they are helping to maintain the building. Up to now, Tico Orozco, who is the coordinator of the, of the building, they are being having events every weekend and it has become very successful. So here you see Tico having uh, radio uh, workshops where the kids go out to the community and report what's going on in their community, having uh, art kind of events. Also, uh, we designed this, uh, this way that you can have access to internet, connection to information outside. And on the weekends, they have uh, theaters uh, at the outside. Almost every weekend, there's, there's a community theater that comes in and has a play in there. And also at night, they have uh, movies or concerts. So the building is lively during the day and, and, and night. So I, I would say that it's trying to be used as much as they can uh, uh, 24 uh, hours, right? Well, let's say day and night. So now I'm gonna show you a small video to get a sense of, of, this, of what is going on. Um, now, uh, this is a project also with uh, the government. This is for uh, the National Public Health Service in Mexico. And this project, as many projects with the government, says you, there's no money and we, we, we would like you to help us in creating these modules. These uh, modules are for the, for, for the most remote communities in Baja California to design uh, 
these uh, modules, they can have service access to healthcare and registration to healthcare. This uh, project uh, was a very limited project in the sense that we needed to design in one week and there was a budget of $4,000 and the idea was to design 28 modules that can be distributed all along Baja California. So uh, knowing that in one week what we can build very fast, we, we tap in like many other projects of, uh, of, uh, of having done uh, uh, containers. So in this case, we, we tap into the manufacturing plants here and said, like, can we use containers? And, and we got three containers and then reconfigure these two containers to give uh, a, a sense of, uh, of uh, accessibility, uh, becoming a clinic, right, in a way, and also enrolling people in a very kind of uh, simple way. And here's the, the prototype, and hopefully now with the circumstances that's going on right now, these prototypes right. are being uh, uh, also used in, 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 yeah. in the way that it's construct, constructing that. Uh -huh. Sorry, I'm hearing somebody there. Uh, there. So, um, in in a way that this uh, this uh, modules being deployed right now, hopefully they can use it right with the, the, the situation and um, and just using containers and just using paint. And sometimes what we question here is how how um, let me just how how just paint in in many ways is 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 the architecture. For the majority of it, and uh, and yes, so they're deployed now. Uh, I don't know how many. Hopefully, they're functioning great right now. I, I, I'm looking uh, forward later on to know the, how they they, they they are performing. So now I'm going to go to a, a project that it, we did here in Tijuana about three houses. This uh, in Playas, and this house is. Um, react to the conditions of, of, of the containments and the, the growth of in, in, in policy, right? For instance, the planning, the smart growth in Tijuana, in San Diego, and then the policies of growth or kind of administration in, 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 in sorry, from San Diego and Tijuana, they're designed very separately. They, don't, they are not designed in conjunction. These two conditions that, uh, of how to administer the land greatly impacts what uh, housing uh, market is being uh, developed in both sides of the border. So in here, in this case, what we see is the impact, how uh, when we put it together, these palettes, they are, they are designed independently and in, in, in they are intricately connected. The green belt halt that was generated from, from the San Diego has created a speculation frenzy. So the containment of the city created a, a huge, uh, uh, disparity of the cost of rent in housing. So what happens with families who work at Walmart, Costco, or food chains, where income is low and they have families. It has a very difficult to live in the U.S. and maintain a quality of life. So what happens is an exodus from, from San Diego to Tijuana, where you see a lot of people coming uh, to get some low-income housing provided through the border market to an increased group of families that that they see Tijuana as an opportunity. In a way, creating an upscale for them, for the people from San Diego, right? But it's a filtering process uh, form of San Diego to Tijuana. What happens also is that Tijuana residents, when they have, they cannot compete with the dollar, they, they downscale. The middle class goes to the low, and low to rent in the inner slums or squatter. This has been an effort to, the, there has been an effort to freeze this condition, but it's a, it's a fact that it's becoming more and more predominant. So what is the housing stock? So what we wanted to do is that uh, how, do we, how do we start kind of handling, how to kind of start producing uh, what Infonavit might what have done because after 2008, they went bankrupt. So there was no development in, the, in any area for the last uh, eight or nine years also. So what usually happens inside the city is that they create in these lots, which is a uh, 12 by 25, uh, two houses and we created four units, three units, sorry, four meters wide, and trying to densify and try to create a, a unit that could be flexible for, for families. In this case, we created this uh, three units, like you see here, and then the, the bedroom and, and, and two bedrooms on the top, and trying to kind of have this opportunity of how to change it. I'll show you in the next diagram. 
the this unit then can be transformed in from becoming a house of three bedrooms with a mezzanine right here, that that's the living room, that can become into one unit studio mess with the mezzanine, another one bedroom and a two bedroom. And hopefully if they need more, they can become this portion part in commercial. What happens also is that uh, many families, of course, the, the house that we, they leave, they become the main resource. So when the kids grow older, also, they say, well, we need to sublet one of the units. So this way, we were thinking, how can they live in one of the units and then sublet the other ones and still have the flexibility when they have the full the need of the whole house or then subdivide the house. So here you see now the, the, the building is a very simple building. It was needed to be compete with Burri, needed to compete with Hell. They are a very, very stringent budget, $250 per square meter. And so we came very crucial to kind of create uh, an efficiency of how we, how we build it. So here you see how the four, from the front side became more enclosed, but try to open up as much as we can from the back side, and trying to bring that much light and create the maximum usability for those four meter wide condition. And here you see how now a, a, a family is using it. The, she, she works in a restaurant and she lives with her parents and, and the parents live in the second floor and she lives in the, in the third floor and the third usually has the, the two bedrooms and they share the kitchen and share the common areas. So now I'm, uh, I'm gonna show you two projects that we work with um, in Fonavit, which is a, um, the housing institute, uh, the agency in charge of developing so low income social housing in Mexico. Here uh, uh, about the, the crisis in 2008, many uh, companies went bankrupt, leaving void uh, that nobody was trying to generate any housing. So in Fonavit, a semi-private entity of national funding, the national fund renewed its interest to more actively be involved because since the 1980s, one, one, where once in Fonavit was actively planning and building housing developments, it became more like a banking institute. So they stepped away. In, the, in, that, in that situation, when that happened in 2008 with the, with the economic crisis, all the companies went bankrupt, and now they, the, the type of projects they were doing, of course, they were very, very bad. They were just urbanizing, not creating city. So Infonet came back and asked architects to, to participate once again, and they created a call to, to design different prototypes uh, throughout Mexico. And so in this case, we, are, we created this prototype for Tecate. They asked us to design this uh, module, uh, but but they didn't tell us which community or where we, we were going to design uh, this uh, unit. They just said, this, let's design some prototype for Tecate. In this case, we found this community, which is a community Hindu. And it's a community that, that the majority of their, of their work uh, is about producing brick, producing, producing uh, um, brick for experience for export to, to, for the US. And this community is about 400 inhabitants at the outskirts of the city. But uh, what we wanted to do is, is, is how to work with them. And, and, and of course, they are already producing brick, but how do we work with them in creating, uh, yes, what they're already doing, but how can we create a, a better way of, of arranging their space? So here we see the, the project and in, in, in very basic terms, what we wanted to incorporate now is how the growth of the community, right? How this, this idea of uh, using the brick, right? As a main source of material, but becomes a relation between the product and dwelling, the production of an extension of the family. This is a standardization of, of openings, right? All the openings from the windows, from the doors are generated equally in that way to create a series of scenarios how to grow horizontally, but also grow vertically. And because many of the families who come to the community, they come from Oaxaca, and once they're settled, they're settled and creating a, a stable, somewhat stable economy, let's say, they start bringing more family members, and usually they're, 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 they're working together as a company and they live together very closely. So in this case, what one of the reasons is how to kind of produce this unit that was able to to grow, but also 
how the, the main aspect of the patio becomes a, a system of how to articulate the entrance and how to create a process of filtration because they're working on the outside, working with clay, and how that space becomes a cleansing space, a way of filtering to the, to the house. Here you see on the left uh, the overall growth of that unit. Now, going back to the floor plan, here's the, the, what we were talking about, the patio, and how the patio, yes, is articulating uh, the old unit, and then that's what we're thinking, that, that these people can use this space, right, to kind of create a space of transition at the same time in, 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 and unifying the whole unit. So at the end, we didn't know, right? Not knowing at the end, it was a sort of competition of 150 plus proposals for the research and experimentation laboratory uh, of a house in Infonavit. It's like uh, an hour uh, from Mexico City. The, the, they selected 32 proposals and we were part of those 32 proposals. Uh, the master plan, uh, the, 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 what you see here in front of you, uh, front of you is the is the design of Moss Architects. They were part of the selection also. So the Laurete Center uh, we will be, is used as a meeting point for reflection and improvement of housing for, for how developers can come and see the prototypes as, as a testing, was a test. So although it's great uh, that Infonami is aggressively investing, right, and in, in was involved in it, we, we were a little bit, honestly, we were a little bit disappointed that suddenly these units were not built where we were intended for, and they became more like this showcase of, of, of units. Although, in some way, in a positive way, I think it was good to kind of see and prove that we were able to build under budget. So here you see the, the unit now the, with a courtyard, the entrance, the, the idea of the, of the at patio, the articulation of standardization of the entrances, the interior is very minimal, right? And, and, and really great because suddenly it was published in the summer of Architect, right? Well, showing all the projects. And the, the budget was to build the unit with 11,812 pesos, like 225,000 pesos. Well, it's gonna be less now because the, the pieces is devaluating every time. And, uh, but the house, we, we were able to build that, the house with $8,000 and we were having a plus of right, $3,000. So we were considering that now by lowering the cost to make it affordable, really thinking about how to make it affordable, you have $3,000 now, they can use it for what they think is more appropriate, maybe to start a, a, a little bit of a, a better coming in investment to their units. So the fund that the Infonavit is creating, they, is, it can be used also as a productive condition space of how to be productive and kind of create a business. So great because also when we see the other projects, and this is something that we, we, we like to kind of know that how do you see, for instance, even projects that suddenly they, they went way out of budget, budget $16,000, $13,000. We were considering that we need to know that our architects know when to stop and when to know that it's not about just creating the, the architecture. And the architecture is not about just experimenting formal conditions, but that architecture is, it needs to reach out. It needs to come out on, on out from the discipline of architecture and be able to understand that what is the impact that we're constructing, what is the, the limitation that we have, and, and be responsible while we're constructing outside. So here's another project that we did. Those two, two, two uh, firms that were selected, now they asked us to design um, a project in Monterrey, Mexico, that is a, a higher density inside of the developments of Urbi and Keo, which is a six meter by 50 meter wide lot, very, very small. And the idea is that they say, well, we need to really densify it. We need to kind of create a densification and show the developers that we can kind of produce a better density while how to kind of be flexible. In this case, even the studies we were generating in school at housing that was with the students was very influential because the ideas of, of floor area ratio, uh, start, we started to test transformation area ratios and productive area ratios. In this case, what you can see is that um, the strategy of just um, knowing usually you have uh, the living room and kitchen in the middle, you have two bedrooms on the side. 
you say, well, let's, let's just put them at the end. And, that, and then strategically just put the stairs on this side, on the front side, then suddenly that front uh, space of one bedroom can easily be transformed because you, uh, most, almost 60% or 50% at least of the people who live in these communities, they need another source of income. The only, the only, the, the income that they get from the formal uh, um, economy is not enough. So they have to create another uh, uh, economy to bring into the house to be sustained, to be able to live. So, in this case, that's the the main uh, idea: how to kind of produce that in a very simple way, uh, trying to be on budget, right? And so suddenly, this unit becomes a way to to transform the bottom right the bottom part as a way to transform to become more commercial become different scenarios like a mechanic shop like a little market like a, a bigger production area but things that they don't need to be on the ground specifically they can become something like for instance here a small uh, tailor shop or a little bit of a, of a restaurant, or now uh, you take uh, more space and, and you need to have converted into a production area. So the flexibility of converting that unit, and that's where we talk about transformation area ratios, and also how productive the space can be to generate income. And the, the whole idea of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the facade and the aesthetic was just to create this kind of, like the, the, the plastic that is being common, commonly used in Nakapulco chairs, it could be something of a, of a, of a screen uh, of the facade, and also as an identifying element that it, these buildings, as they pop out throughout the neighborhood, they become referenced in, by the idea of the color. That they, I live in the pink one, I live in the blue one, I live in the yellow one. So this becomes also as a reference element. Now I'm going to talk about this project, uh, which is a hospital, uh, and this is an emergent typology. This is an immunity center, cancer treatment center hospital that relates to the increased medical tourism that has been increasing in great space in the last eight years in Tijuana. The scenario was that the, the border region with the five states as you as the south of the border, right? In this case, you see, for instance, as it gets darker, uh, the population on the U.S. side. Uh, what it means is that there are like um, 25, and here in this area, almost 20-25% 20, of the people, they don't have insurance, they don't have accessibility to, to medical service. So that's why the border became, became more and more popular to get uh, uh, um, medical attention or even buy uh, drugs, buy uh, medication on the south side. For sure, in the 10 years or 15 years, uh, dentists have become very predominant service to the U.S but more in the, in the last eight years, uh, as medical treatments has become more expensive, they, they come to Tijuana. So this emerging typology, this emerging typology has started to become more economically feasible uh, for doctors in Tijuana and also kind of giving service. It became uh, a new emerging typology that starts to dominate, it starts to dominate the, the, the core of the city. So it's calculated the city receives around 1.2 million people linked to seek health treatments, and, and two million come with their companies or, or families to seek uh, doctor consultations. It's a competitive cost uh, of, of consultations. So procedures of drugs, surgeries, uh, prices, the prices range between 30 and almost 70% less compared to the US. So this project, uh, so what we, what we saw is that as, as the city starts densifying and, and, and this type of starts emerging, for instance, the one on the left, this is a building dedicated to, to, to the service of, of, uh, of eye, eye surgery, uh, treatments of, of the eye, all about uh, uh, the sense of how to kind of work with the, with the problems of, of your eye, right? And then this, this prototype that we started designing is that as a cancer treatment directly to service of cancer. So here you see the building. And one of the things that we, we also were concerned is how this is a very transit, uh, highly transit street. This is even the street, directly the street where you start making line to go to the US to cross the border. So one factor is, how to kind of create a buffer, how to kind of isolate, how to protect also what's going on inside, but also looking for ways to kind of open up. And in the end, uh, of course, key factors that were considered was the layout, patient, staff flows, ventilation, material selection, and treatment of source, but most critically was 
designing for the people and their lifestyles, while increasing design strategies for reducing medical uh, errors. So how the layouts of a room could help in safer practice for medical staff, which elements can be introduced to improve social life, and also how the idea of, of, of working, the, the, now we are talking about a lot, right, distancing and then kind of the way of sequencing space. So the orientation was key fact. One of the things that we try, usually in the hallways, right, uh, when we're going to produce is these uh, little niches of seating so people can sit down and when they're walking, it becomes a way to kind of incentivize this idea of community. Also, what uh, the other aspect is that how to bring kind of these lockers on the side of the, of the door that uh, instead of centralizing all the medical, uh, all, the, all the medicine into the nurse's uh, uh, station, can be distributed to each room, and that reduces the uh, doing a lot of research and consulting between ways of practices and what will be the best way to reduce the errors. The other factor, I hopefully you can hear me. The other factor was how to standardize the direction of all the units and having all the installations in one side of all the, the rooms. In that way, reducing also, but if we were mirroring this, they were more likely to, the doctors or the nurses to create errors. So everything was standardized in those things. And then the other thing is about how to create uh, areas of working stations so people can not only feel that they're just in the medical room, but also they have working areas. And then also how, for instance, the, the aspect of how the, the families come with the, the, the patients come with families and we created units where they incorporate the, um, a whole like a, an apartment where they can bring their family to. So these two factors are, are the, the one of the things that we were really looking for to kind of improve uh, and how to kind of reduce errors in the medical um, operation of it. So the building is under construction right now. I don't know if it's still going right now. Uh, hopefully, um, there's a safe way they're, they're doing it right now. I don't know uh, what will be the outcome, but right now it's under construction. Hopefully, we are able to 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 have a, a good outcome and, uh, as, as we pass through this crisis right now. So uh, this is a project now that we we work um, and with uh, Tyler Hansel, who teaches at the MRED, Philip Wolfhart, and and Georgina Vest. It was a really interesting project that we, we, we say, how do we work on the U.S.? How do we start kind of considering some strategies in the U.S. side? So here, uh, this is the lot that, uh, how it was bought, right? Uh, uh, Tyler Hansel, who, has, who was key in, 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 in creating the group and bringing us all together, um, so he found the, the lot and was really great as an opportunity because here you have a lot that it was only one house, but the, the great find was that this lot can be subdivided into four lots. And so what started as a one single lot slowly started to be divided, right? The, the division of four lots, then the division of easements and of course this kind of notion of division and kind of fragmentation also started to resonate and the idea of how we start kind of always dividing and dividing and dividing spaces even more and they're in spite of our, our, our notion of architecture. So in this case also, what we saw is that suddenly by, by rules that uh, how to culture or, or the acceptance of, of these spaces, that even us as, a, as we were creating the units, everybody was trying to kind of, kind of go inward and then creating more a way of privacy. Now how cordial to elements were, were going to be preserved as a more private element. And in this case, we, we, we decided to, to, to push back as much as we can the unit, right? And now creating four units, four houses, quote unquote, but every house was going to try to divide each house into four units. And at the end, creating uh, overall around 16 units overall. But we wanted to kind of push back the building as much as we can to create this space and saying, if, if, the, if the, as a thermometer saying, how can the front yard, how these spaces are, can become more collective, more communal in that sense. So here you see, for instance, how we were considering that the front part becomes a stage, becomes a space that people can collect and become a, a space for community. 
in like we're saying this this is how you see now the the the, the division of the unit so if this becomes a one bedroom this is a one bedroom uh, element also and then the second floor becomes another one bedroom in another kind of studio so here you have the, the four units but we, like i said the most important thing they start to become is how the datum of that edge or how the idea of this division that this edge as a datum we start considering that people can negotiate those three three feet wide here and the other three feet wide from the other house, the neighbors, that become a space that people can interact or a, a space of dialogue, a space that we can inject to, to create community. So here it is what we were considering. So at the end, what we're, we were saying is that that becomes a way to define also the facade. That's a way to define how people can kind of, hopefully they can have kind of barbecues, they can have kind of hammocks or things to hang out. And then the facade in the front, we just say, we need to accentuate that facade in, in a very simple way, but accentuating that to create a, a, a staging and it becomes a, something of, a, of, a, of a, the element of the, the the attractor, the point of reference of the space, of the communal space. So um, this is a project now that also we usually don't um, do um, competitions. We like to more, we like more to, to, give me one second, sorry. This is more about how, how um, a project that can, that can be about how this 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 uh, research we do, and then not only for competitions, but how how sometimes we do it. But but uh, but in this case, we were interested because it was something about the border, of course, and said, okay, this can be linked to to, to the condition because otherwise we just work for, for work that is more uh, pointed in in communities. So. Here uh, we talked about this competition that was for Arquine, that is, uh, that is a competition that they do yearly. This was uh, three years ago, if I, if I remember well. And it was to create a, a, um, a center for migrants. And what we did is that we started talking about that the that, that, that purpose is not in one point, but considering how if the border can become something more representative. And in this sense, the idea of, of the Zócalo to Mexico, Central Park to New York, or how these pieces in, in the urban uh, context become relevant of identity. And we're saying instead of negating the border, instead of diluting the border, or instead of just accepting it, it becomes a space that we inhabit. It becomes a space that really becomes an opportunistic landscape, an escape that we can reconsider where we are and what we're doing. So here you see a series of scenarios along the border. This is, of course, speculative, but it tells us a question what we, what we, what we, what we work as a border. That it, it can be a space that we, we inhabit, a space we can celebrate it in some way, or a way to kind of start some, some, some dialogue. So the problems based on uh, Latin necessity as an emerging component that identifies the opportunistic landscape where the, the migrants and the cities needs are, cup, uh, are occupied and reflected specifically at the border, a space that was uh, once once denied or how now becomes a negotiator uh, that produces a new social cultural environment. So it's an opportunity not in uh, hybridization, but as a space for dialogue that goes back and revalues the uh, contributions of uh, the collective in, in the great urban infrastructure. So uh, and then at the end, what, the question is uh, that sometimes resonates is yes, about Mr. Fuller's how much your, your building weigh, more in the sense of environmental factors. But for us, the question has been more, um, how civic is your, your building? How much those things you design contribute to the civic condition, to the city in itself? So, well, there's a lot of certification parameters like LEED and, and, and things like that to kind of talk about the environmental uh, conditions. I mean, I'm not advocating for, for civic kind of certifications, but, but how do we need to start considering also what is, the, what is the implication of our buildings in a civic and cultural environment? So in this case, uh, that's why even the, the research we were doing in, 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 in Rome tries to kind of help us research and kind of tap in into that. And I'm just going to briefly talk about uh, the project of Adriana. This was the, the research of Adriana. I'm just going to go just to get a framework. So, for instance, uh, in, the, in the time 12 years ago when Adriana got the, the 
mapping to understand to understand the movement of people trying to register how there is a DNA of, of, of understanding the, the livelihood of the city between inside the Aurelian world, outside the Aurelian world. So we started constructing a series of, of studies and, 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 and understanding behaviors. And then this became a series of, of ways of, of, of grafting or, or, or kind of understanding a DNA of what was inside the, the wall and what's inside the wall in, in a way predicting what are the, the qualities that creates intensities in the city. At the end, now 12 years later, um, I think it's an evolution that we were, I was trying, what we were trying to do in the, in, in the industry was to study the stairs of Fernando San Felice. These stairs um, in Naples, they were done in the 17th century, more or less, and, and, uh, and studying the, the impact of these stairs. So as you, what you can see here is um, the stair, the street that takes you to Fernando San Felice's Palazzo, and what you see in the left is Sanita 2, and then what we see in the, in, in the right is Sanita 6. So it's, it's just has two entrances, and I will talk about why do you have these two entrances and why the division of these spaces. But anyways, the, the stairs become a very uh, important uh, uh, element that is the second layer of facade or the second element that kind of frames the space. So here we see the, the photograph, and I'm going to show you now a video. So you see how this is the, 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 the stair of um, scroll stair. Now, we'll see, this is uh, the stairs of Tanisa 6, which is the Ala di Falco, that's the name of the stairs. And these stairs, uh, as you can see here, there are stairs that kind of link uh, the, the, the courtyard, the courtyard in the back, and then connecting these four levels. And then the top level was the, the, the space of Fernando San Felice, the architect and designer of these stairs, which his, it was his palazzo. So why the stairs? Well, so what, why the relevance of these stairs in relationship to the city? So uh, here what you see is a map from uh, the period of the Agenvine uh, in the, by Duperec in 1556. And what you can see is a map that shows us how the perimeter of the city was trying to be contained, right? And, and containing the city mainly for two reasons. One, because at the, at the moment where the, the viceroy of, 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 um, of Naples was under Spanish ruling, right? They were trying to control the city, trying to tax, get better taxes of the inhabitants in the city. But at the same time, keeping people outside in the agriculture to sustain the city. So those were the main factors in a way to contain and preserve the city as they wanted to kind of have it in that moment in saying that it has to be in that density. Of course, the other aspect we see is that 
here uh, via de Toledo the, of, of the Viceroy of, 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 of later in, in time, in the new Spanish quarter in this area. So it was a shifting, right? When there was the center of the city here, they were shifting to a new center, but they were also trying to contain it and preserve the city as they thought it was going to be better uh, as a city to live in. And in this spirit, right, you can see Map. Now, the next map, map, you see a map by Barata in 1627. And in this map, we can see how even the map, the map is used uh, as, a, as a way to uh, show power. And, and now the, the Spanish quarter is centralized, is kind of put in the center of the map. And then the, the, the old center is pushed to the side. But also you can start seeing how the, uh, the population starts growing outside. And the, the wall starts to kind of a little bit kind of get blurry in one sense. But anyways, so what, what this map shows a little bit of how the growth of the city was starting to produce. And it becomes interesting in the next map. Now, this map is the map of Duca di Noja. It was done in similar way to the Noli map. And many of the people he was, they were, he, the Noli used, uh, Duca di Noja uh, did it. This is a, a 1775 in the map. In many similar ways, what uh, uh, Noli was doing is it how to identify the continuation between public and private space and how the continuation of these spaces was going to the church, but a little bit different. Anyways, this map was generated because Duke and Noli was making an argument to, to, to the viceroy saying, we need to have a map that's better kind of uh, drawn in the sense, right? But better in the sense to kind of administrate what is going on in the city and have a more kind of control way of the different uh, parcels and elements that were being developed in the city. But at this period, the growth of the city now starts becoming more and more and more. And it becomes more because the, they could be contained. So the stairs, in this moment, the stairs is where we start seeing how became an opportunity to grow vertically. So many of the buildings start to fuse and change. And so the stairs becomes an opportunity to create even illegal development of the palazzos in the, in the, in the, in the, in the city. But he was able to, to convince them to, to generate, to kind of catalog and kind of have a registration of the city. So here you see um, uh, a map of uh, Duca de Noja and the two stairs that we we're talking about of Fernando San Felice. So the one in the right uh, here is the uh, number two and this is number six. This is a space of even similar to Noli, how to create this idea of continuity. Why is this continuity? Because as I was saying, suddenly the palazzo started to kind of fragment and, and then suddenly you don't see the palazzo as an individual piece, but it, they start subletting and start incorporating the layers of the different levels to rent the units. Uh, I was able to cat, uh, catalog in uh, around 220, 330 buildings along, and how these even these buildings start becoming very interesting. They start kind of pulling just outside the border wall, uh, the, what it was, the, the, the wall, and then inside the city, transforming itself, this dialogue between inside and outside. But really interesting um, uh, for me, it was an interesting find that suddenly in the 19th century, of many years that all this was happening, the moment that every, that transformation of the city was happening, comes the map of Federico Schiavoni. This is a map from the 19th century. And Federico Schiavoni uh, documents uh, very interestingly this, this, uh, this uh, event that happened of the transformation of the city. In this case, now similar to the one we see that, uh, of Nolima, now Federico Schiavoni draws all the stairs, all the stairs of every palazzo, man in this scale of all the palazzos drawn meticulously in the stair. And I think that that's, for me, the evolution of talking about how the stair became a continuation of the, sp of the stairs and how the city became more vertical. So this is a, a change of uh, the verticality of a sociopolitical landscape. And so the stair becomes an opportunity of growth of the illegality, but then starts to be formalized and trying to now become the essence of the city. So here we see, we'll see, for instance, now the change of, of, of maps from uh, Duca di Noia to Federico Schiavoni, and how the fusion and transformation of these palazzos. Here is the one we were talking about, of, of, uh, of uh, Federico, not Federico Schiavoni, so uh, uh, du, uh, 
Fernando San Felice, you have the two stairs. And also that later the transformation of other typologies that were coming more similar in replicating this idea and then becoming the, the normal, the new normal throughout the city. So here's this, the, the other Palacio de Españolo, right? And then here you see now the two quotes uh, that kind of synthesizes, um, from my point of view, these two paradigms, the idea of geometry, the idea of how the complexities within negotiating and articulating the stairs and how they were needed to be kind of an element that kind of brings light, kind of an element that articulates the, the, the courtyard, but also kind of articulating the, the other spaces but also how uh, Cesar Ezeta talks about the idea of thresholds, the idea of borders, the idea of limits, and how this becomes a space of, of, of livelihood and negotiation. So at the end, uh, what uh, Federico Schiavoni, the idea of all these kind of stairs and all these kind of courges, represented that this was the main ingredient that really represents uh, the city, in my point of view, that really represents that how that an element, architectural element, has an implication at the urban scale. How this element has becomes an opportunity to become the, the gateway to grow, to create from to formal formal aspects. So. Uh, it was a very fine interest because I think that architecture now be, is, starts to tell us, yes, the question we're trying to raise, how civic, how these elements become more public, how these elements contribute to society, how these elements have an impact at the city scale. Thank you. That's my presentation. Uh, hopefully uh, it was something that was of interest and, and I can take any questions if you have. Thank you so much, Marcel. That was inspiring, and um, I'm so glad we recorded it. So, um, does anybody have questions? We can um, put it probably best to put it into the chat box. And so Marcel, maybe I'll start with your a question. Um, I love that you started with your garden in Tijuana and ended with the courtyard in Italy. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about how those two um, environments, one is you know, certainly um, dense urban condition and then the condition you showed in the garden. You, I mean, almost all of your, the spaces you showed had some sort of courtyard space you know, where you're embracing an outdoor space, um, that seems a sort of trope or a, a, a common uh, theme in your work. Can you talk a little bit about that? I'd love to hear a little bit yeah, more. I, yes, you, you're right. Uh, yes, uh, we, we think that the, the edge or like the border is, is a very physical one. And I think that the courtyards or the spaces in between become this kind of kind of expansion of a limit or expansion of a, of a, of a space that is being uh, uh, expanded in time in, in in space that has this kind of way of of transition from from one threshold to another threshold and I think that the courtyards or the spaces become these spaces that accentuates the space of negotiation the in betweenness and I think that the the courtyards becomes a space of dialogue a space that we can have a a, a moment that to reflect what we are going through in space. And I think that, the, that that's why we, we, we consider that these spaces in different scales, and not only in the scale of a building, but at different scales in the city also, that, that these spaces of the in-betweenness of these spaces, that how, what are the degrees that you're negotiating these spaces? And what are the, the aspects that we always, uh, I, I think that the city is, is, is a multi-layer series of conditions of limits that are constantly being negotiated and how we are always in this, in this constant negotiation of a courtyard, of an entrance, of a street. I don't know, maybe it's for me that being so close to this thing that I always think in this, in this, in this character. That was beautifully elaborated. Um, you talked about a project that you're doing in the United States. Could you talk a little bit about the differences that you're finding doing work or building work in the United States compared to building the work in Mexico? Yes, I, I think that uh, in Mexico, of course, you can get away with many things. 
because of the of of a very yes technical and bureaucracy that you can do. And then, uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy, but there's a lot of corruption and many things that uh, you can do things. And of course, in the U.S., it's, it's not that it doesn't happen, but it's a little bit more difficult, right? And of course, it's something that is, uh, you have to kind of convey things. But what is interesting is that the idea of separation or the idea of, of isolation is something that I, I see it sometimes even more stronger in the US, maybe I'm wrong, but I see, for instance, the project, in this project we're working on, that's what I was trying to, we were trying to see that the, the, the culture is the one that promotes that, maybe a little bit more. And then saying, how do we create platforms to override that? So is the project can be a thermometer for doing that. In New Mexico is like, Yes, we have these edges and they are very strong. And even with my neighbors, I have very strong, but, but it's not as so much as, uh, it's not so evident. And that's one from one side. And the other thing is, I think that uh, in, in the US side, uh, I really like that, that, that there's opportunities to kind of test these ideas that we have in, in Mexico, that, 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 sees, that they see how they kind of translate or see how they kind of react to it. And I think that there's a great opportunity to, to see these things, not to romanticize them. I, I, I'm not about talking about these ideas of, of romanticizing these conditions, but it's how to kind of see that these cultures try to kind of work together and how architecture becomes a way of reflecting kind of a thermometer for that. Thank you. I'm also struck by how beautiful all of your drawings are and how each drawing clearly delineates another idea that you have, although they all share a love and a care for the craft of drawing as well. Um, so that, that's just an observation as well. Thank you. Yes, I, I think, just to comment, I think that drawing has, of course, like we think that drawing becomes a, a, a mode of research and uh, the, the drawing, um, we, we try to use drawing as a way to help us, uh, our, um, yes, to discover and, and to help us to visualize what we're trying to say, for sure. So Kyle has a question, Marcel. Can you touch on the logic behind using the color white for a large majority of your projects? It seemed to be a commonality, stitching your projects together, but is there a symbolic reasoning behind white cost personal philosophy? I think that's very observant. Um, yes, I think that uh, something that uh, I, we were not totally uh, in saying that white is, is was going to be an aesthetic condition. It was more about reacting to the to the circumstances and saying in in the way that the materiality was not important. Like we were talking on the on the library, we were, we don't think that the expression of materiality was the most relevant thing. So the expression of materiality was more to be economical and let let be a canvas and things happens to it. But suddenly we found out it was okay, we were wrong. People say they didn't touch it. But now so we said, well, that's kind of interesting. We, we, we would like to continue with that the idea of creating kind of a setback and see how far we can stretch that idea of saying how people are going to be engaging and respecting it. And then for us, it was more about, okay, it's, it's, it's a production of, of the dialogue we're having in the context. And certainly Marcel Duchamp had a fascination with dust as well. And you talked about the accumulation of dust. So that was, uh, yeah. white is the perfect medium for that. All right. Well, I think um, unless anybody has any further questions, you can certainly turn on your microphone as well. If, you ha if anybody has any questions, um, I, you know, the, you talked about the courtyard as a place of dialogue in a way this talk that you gave us is, um, is also in a way a sort of, temporal courtyard in our days and I want to thank you very much for giving us um, those inspiring images. Um, oh, Hector has a question. Yeah. Marcel, uh, yeah. your beautiful study of the stairs, uh, that project in Naples, uh, it's alluded to at the end that these architectural elements, the stairs, um, were utilized as tools to add value, real estate value, uh, development value to the, to the city. Uh, uh, what would you say now that you are um, becoming a, an architect developer in San Diego? In San Diego, uh, what would you say are the main driving uh, elements in that real estate uh, project in Golden Hill? Um, obviously, there there is there are some that you you bring added value. What are those elements that are that you think are adding value to your project there? I, I would say that, is, and I think that. 
sometimes we, and it's very difficult because when you start creating these stairs or you start creating these interstitial spaces saying, who's gonna pay for it, right? We always ask this question saying, that's, that's, that's space that is, somebody has to pay for it. And I think that they were, that's where we're trying to see even going back to just the stairs in Naples, right? That these stairs become, they became very productive because they became a way to kind of divide even more um, the, the units or the palazzo, but create more people inside and how the stairs became in some way feasible, right? In many ways. And I think that in, in, in our project is more the, the, the stairs, let's say stairs amphitheater, that that could be value to it and saying how that space is maybe not gives value economically right away, but I think in the long run, by creating this opportunity of collective space, that we see it, how that's going to be value to the, to the neighbors, they will give the value to us as well. So it's a very simple idea of saying, if you give to the other ones, they will come back and give to yourself. So in this case, we're saying, well, let's give more frontage, let's give that, that stairs, and we, we're betting on it, it's a risk, but we're betting that that could come back and kind of gives us more than trying to just capitalize it inside of it. Well, the, you know, it, it's a beautiful element and a beautiful gesture. And it, I think it circles back to your initial statement, how the interest in, in, in the, um, the value that uh, the, the social added value of an architectural project is seldom measured, you know, and uh, I think this gesture that you, 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 you focus on, uh, I think does that. It's sort of you're investing uh, into a communal uh, value that this element will provide, not only for, to the immediate uh, neighbors, to your, your other three neighbors, but also within, within your unit, it provides a stage for socializing. So I, I, I think, um, and I really appreciate the clarity of, of, of some of the, the, the intentions that you have, from beginning of the project to execution. And I would love to see more of, uh, of, of your interest in, in, uh, in economy, in construction economy, become applied to the work that you start doing here in, in, in San Diego. But thank you, it was really beautiful work. Thank you. So I think, um, I think that's a good place to end. It's 1.30 and uh, I suspect people have class and other meetings as well. But thank you so much, Marcel. That was a remarkable um, breadth of work, but so rigorous and so um, thoughtful. So thank you, Marcel. Thank you. Thank you.